I decided to unleash our inner child when I did decorating this week, and so here's what we got. <laughs> no, that wasn't my design. Uh, we do have VBS coming up this week. We're pretty excited about this. This is all about the kids, so we're excited for that to happen. So it's a shared space. You know, that's, that's what families do is they share the space, and sometimes you have to put up with decorations you wouldn't have put up yourself otherwise, right? Let's stand, and we're going to worship together. over the schedule for the last time we sang that song here, and it was over six years ago. Can you believe that? That's been a long time. <laughs> I know, crazy. All right, moving on. We got a couple of things to remind you of. Go ahead and pick up the communion if you haven't yet. It's on the tables on the side and in a basket 
and in the back. And along with that, would you grab our bulletin? In there, you'll find our connection card. Please just take a quick moment to fill that out. You can place it in the offering boxes located on the walls as you exit today. Go ahead and take a moment to say hi to those around you. Fix my eyes on you. 
time I grab one of these, which is our communion cup, whether it be like this, packaged, or in a tray that's served around open, I'm reminded of the many hundreds, if not thousands, of communion meditations that I heard before we took this together. How many of you were raised in a church like that, where you had a communion meditation before every single time you took communion every Sunday? Same here. 
You, many of you probably have had that a lot more than I have. Let me ask you a question now. How many of those communion meditations do you actually remember what they said? I mean, 98% of the time it was about bread and juice or wine, right? But you can't really talk about the specifics. There may be a handful out there. I know for me, I can think of about five off the top of my head that were a little above and beyond, a little more meaningful. Uh, one of them wasn't even on purpose. I remember there was this older gentleman that brought out this woodworking tool set and he laid it across the table. And as he's giving this illustration, he's talking about all of the different tools and the different tasks that they have. And it was basically correlating us as people and we all have a different role. And at the time, if you said, don't be a tool, that meant don't be an idiot, right? That was my generation. His generation didn't catch that though. So we kept on asking throughout this meditation, what kind of a tool are you for Christ? And so we sat there giggling in the back. It, it was a great illustration, but it's just kind of funny how that got lost on the generational part of that. So if we don't remember every single specific meditation that's ever done, why do we continue to do it every Sunday? And I would draw you to the sermon for that as well. Why do we do that every Sunday? How about the songs? Why do we do that every single Sunday? Because you can't remember what we sang probably six weeks ago. I know I can't. You can't remember what Kurt maybe preached on six weeks ago. Maybe you can. Maybe it was that impactful for you, that specific one. But just like when you grew up in school and when you're in college and they gave you math homework and you had to do those problems over and over and over, you don't remember it. But you carry that kind of stuff with you for the rest of your life. It's those disciplines and that learning that it all accumulates into a singular understanding. And there's great value in the repetition. There's great value in that discipline. We think of discipline sometimes as a dirty word, but discipline to stay diligent and have some tenacity at the ta task at hand is important. So even though we get up here and we talk about this every Sunday and it's not maybe the most memorable, that repetition is so critical and key for our lives. That's why our Christ says, do this in remembrance of me every time we get together. And so that's what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna take this together and remember what he did on the cross for us. Let me pray. God, as we take this, I thank you for the repetition that you give us. I'm thankful for this idea of discipline and how these things accumulate into being able to, to be able to think through tough times in life. How all of those sermons, how all those meditations just come together to create something more beautiful. Yes, we can't remember specific messages and specific moments in time for the most part, but they are still so important. That's why we're gathered here today, is to remember you. And it's in your name I pray, amen. Well, I hope you like what we've done with the stage here this morning. I thought about wearing uh, the space helmet Titus has. It actually will fit over my head, but I, I didn't know if you wanted to listen to me talk like this the entire morning, although it would really fit with the theme, you know, if we were to do that. But uh, VBS starts uh, this week, so if you've got little uh, kiddos, we'll talk more about it here in just a little bit, uh, but I want to encourage you to, uh, to bring them out. It's going to be a fun uh, week of VBS. Uh, also, too, real quick, thank you, everybody on the, that was involved with the outreach team or that came and helped alongside the outreach team with the parade yesterday. Uh, thank you for helping with the float, for all the work we did. Uh, last week, getting all those cups filled with candy and flyers. It was kind of neat because we walked in the parade right behind this uh, color guard group. 
that was attempting to throw candy to people in the parade, but they were throwing it from like here to there <laughs> in the middle of the road. So we were walking behind him, and we just kept picking that candy up, putting it in our cups, and making our cups look better <laughs> as we handed them out to everybody along the streets. But uh, it was a fun time uh, watching, especially watching a bunch of the kids. Uh, they really ate that up to go out and hand out cups to everybody they saw. My, my middle child was giving them cups whether they wanted them or not, basically just putting them in their cup holders in their lawn chairs even at one point, but uh, it was a good time. A quick question for you. I want you to think about the last time you found yourself stuck in a situation, like you, you were facing a decision you had to make. You didn't want to have to make either of the two options, but that was a decision that you were, were kind of backed into, and you're asking yourself a couple of questions. Number one, how did I get here? And number two, how am I going to get out of here? And maybe that second question even gets twisted. God, how are you going to get me out of here? You make it very specific, angled toward God. And we started talking about Joseph last week, and Joseph is a character that uh, is very prominent in, in the book of Genesis. We said he has more coverage in Genesis than anybody else, even more than Abraham. And, and he's a story that, like many characters in the Old Testament, especially, is very relatable for us. You may not think that you share a lot in common with people from the Bible, but they're just as human as you and, and I are. And, and so we read his story, and, and yes, it's a story that we talked about last week, growing up with privilege and, and being the favorite child and uh, you know, having everything, but then it, you know, it turns on a dime. And now his story becomes a story of rejection, a story of betrayal, a story of hatred, of, of uh, you know, false accusation. And, you know, he, he gets put into bad situations and a story that ultimately culminates with having to face his own demons. That's a story, yeah, we can probably relate to a little bit more than some of the others, right? But as we look at his story, it's one that we're going to follow the next several weeks. We're in week two of this series called Detours and Decisions. Uh, looking through his story, talking about how life throws detours our way, and every time it does, we're left with the decision that we have to make. Last week, when we left off at the end of Genesis 37, he had been sold into captivity by his brothers to a group of Ishmaelites, which are distant cousins of theirs. They are like traveling traders. They took him and sold him to a man named Potiphar, who is in Egypt. And uh, we, we detour into to chapter 39 now because chapter 38 actually detours on its own. It has a whole different story involving one of his brothers and his sister. And let me just tell you, if you think the Bible is very boring, very prudish, very bland, go home and read Genesis chapter 38. Because if it was a movie, you wouldn't let your children watch it, okay? It would uh, be one that you would be glued to going, oh, this is in the Bible? Like, it's pretty, pretty uh, graphic, right? But as we get into chapter 39, we jump ahead in the story eight years. Uh, and Joseph is going to be about a 25-year-old man at this point. And he's in a spot where he's forced to make a decision, knowing there's going to be consequences either way, that ultimately is going to land him in an even bigger detour than he was before. And I want to just set this up by asking you the question, where are you at today? Are you in a detour Today, I, just by the law of averages, I know there are some of you who are. And some of you are not just in a detour, but you're in a big one. You're in a big trial. You're in a spot where you cannot see your way out of this. And when you're there, because we've all been there, it can feel hopeless. It can feel scary. It can feel frustrating. You get angered with it. Can I just give you a little bit of encouragement today? If that's you, don't give up. Keep pushing Keep believing, keep trusting, keep following. See, here's the problem. Often when we're in one of those big, big ruts like that, we look for the quickest and easiest way out of it. Because that we don't care. We just want out of this one. Whatever's next couldn't be as bad as what it is right now. And the problem is when you find the quick, easy way, often it's the wrong way. We want to trust God, and that can be the hard part, but it's a key, pivotal part to following him. But often when we take that quick, easy way out, we take the way that might look the best, at least initially. What we don't realize and understand is that's a, most likely a temptation the enemy's using to trick us. That's one of his greatest weapons is temptation. And we think about temptation, we define it like this. It's the desire to do something, uh, which is a great definition, by the way, right? The desire to do something. Is anybody ever desired to do something? Okay. <laughs> but then we go on, especially something wrong or unwise. Now, 
when we say wrong or unwise, understand this doesn't always mean it's sinful. Sometimes it's just not the right decision. Sometimes the temptation is, you know, spending extra money on something that you really don't need to. Or maybe I, I know some of you out here, I, I probably have had this temptation. No, that cake is for the grandkids. Leave it for later, okay? But there's the temptation to just go ahead and get a little bit now. They won't notice, right? My uncle, uh, Larry, was one of the most godly men that I knew. Uh, was one of those that as he got later in life, his kids were grown and out of the house, he had that, that blessing of he had more money than he knew what to do with, but not enough to give it all to me, right? But, I mean, he had... <laughs> Uh, enough that he would always, you know, always be upgrading his golf clubs, always be upgrading the tires on his truck, or, or just upgrading his truck, actually, for that matter. Uh, he claimed he didn't like to change the air filter, so he would just go get a new truck. And, um, but he would say that, you know, temptation is the one thing in life I can't resist. And, uh, you know, it was just this, this funny saying of his, as if to say he could resist anything as long as it didn't tempt him. But that's temptation, right? You, you get this. You know what we're talking about when we start to talk about something wrong or something unwise. I think we could define it a little differently for us as we walk with God. Whether you're a Christian, whether you're just reading the Bible and finding out people in the Bible, temptation's more like this. It, it's when one has to choose between fulfilling their own desires or staying loyal to God. That's really what sinful temptation is, is more about. It, it's the idea of chasing something that you just really, really want because you know it's going to be fun not caring that it's going to dishonor God. Okay, not caring that, that it's potentially going to lead you down a wrong path because you can, you can correct the path. You can get it back on track. You know, you've been walking with God for a while. You know how to correct the course, right? The problem is that temptation in that moment can lead to a derailment which can lead to decay, which can lead to a destroyed life. And we see this way too often. But what I want to do today is, is maybe take a bit of a different approach to this. Because often we focus on the moment. The moment the decision has to be made. And that's the question that we have to ask is this one. How can a moment alter your life? That's a question that we ask, right? And we see this time and time again. Maybe when we talked about last week when a detour is caused by your own bad decisions or by somebody else's actions that's that moment, right? When you make the decision and you do it, that's when the life can get altered. I don't want to ask that question today because I kind of think we all know the answer to that. I want to back up and take a deeper look at this. Take more of a, of a bird's eye look at this and say what kind of life prepares you for the life-altering moment? Because if you're already at the moment, you're already there where you're making the decision, it might be too late. So what do we need to do in our own lives to prepare ourselves for that moment, just like Joseph did here in his story. See, life has a way of, of throwing twists and turns into the plans that you have and into the path that you have, and those, those can be unfair at times. They can be challenging and difficult at times. They can hurt and cause loneliness at times, and you, you may think you're never going to get out of it. A temptation often comes to you, I think, at one of two times. At least for me, I see temptation really coming hardest at one of two times at my absolute best and at my absolute worst, at my absolute high moments in life and at my weakest, lowest moments in life. I feel like that's when I'm the most susceptible to the temptation. doesn't mean I won't get tempted other times. doesn't mean I won't fail in those temptations other times. But in my own story, I feel like that's where they often come here. And it's in those moments that I have to make that decision. But what have I done before that? See, when I've done the things I'm supposed to be doing ahead of those times, it's much, much easier to stand strong before God. The problem is when you're in the middle of that trial, sometimes those temptations are so enticing. Because when you're in the middle of a trial, what we say last week, those are typically caused by one of three people, you, somebody else, or God. And when you're in that trial, when you're in there, especially if you can recognize that this might be a trial from God, it's easy to get bitter when you're not getting the results that you want in the time that you want, bitterness can seep in, frustration can seep in, and that's really when you're very susceptible. So let's ask a question here today. How do we, how do we avoid all of this? I think kind of the, the, the thought I want to look at and camp out on is this, that if you want to conquer temptation, you have to learn to submit to God's, you could say plan, you could say discipline, you could say just overall story. Learn to submit to his plan 
instead of being bitter towards it. Or if it's God's discipline that you're having to deal with right now, learn to submit to it instead of being bitter towards it. And the question I want to look at is how do we do that? We're going to be in Genesis 39, and we're just going to walk through what happens with Joseph. And there's five keys, I think, that, that we can learn from him that help us to do this right here, to, to submit to God rather than being bitter towards him. So Genesis 39 is where we're going to camp out. The first key is this, learn to practice and protect your integrity. That's our first key. You may think that sounds obvious. You may think that sounds like a no-brainer, but learn to practice and protect your integrity. Uh, chapter 39, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt. Uh, Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of his guard, brought him or bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Push pause really quick and tell you about who Potiphar is. Potiphar, so it says right there, he's the captain of Pharaoh's guard. This isn't necessarily, like, they're, they're military, but they're not necessarily the army who's going to go out and fight. They're the last line of defense. This is the most trusted uh, security personnel Pharaoh has. Pharaoh, or Potiphar, is, is like his number one guy. And not just that, the, the guard, the temple guard that, that he has here, they're his executioners. File that away. We'll come back to this and why that matters here in just a moment. Just know this, Potiphar, he's a big deal. He's a very powerful, very influential, very important person in all of Egypt. Verse 2, this is the key of the entire morning. The Lord was with Joseph. This is a theme. We're going to see this over and over here. He, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. Now again, those three verses right there, just kind of remember those. We'll, we'll explain why here in just a little bit. But you see that Joseph has everything. Yeah, yes, he's technically a servant, technically a slave to somebody, but he's at the top of the org chart. And I don't know how quick this all happened. I would, I would just guess, you know, when he, he was 17 and he was captured and taken, there's a, a bit of time, a few months anyway, before he winds up in the house of Potiphar. Now, eight years later, he has ascended because of God's blessing and favor to basically being the CEO over Potiphar's household. There's a lot that comes with this. And if you've ever been at the top of an org chart, you kind of understand this, right? That leads to our second key here. Guard yourself in times of success. That's kind of the second key to, to uh, being able to submit to God's will here. Guard yourself in times of success. Go to verse, uh, verse 6 of chapter 39. It says, Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. I'm going to pause for a second here. Because I said that we could all relate to Joseph's story, and obviously this is where I relate the most to Joseph's story. Um, <laughs> that was some really, like, sarcastic laughter right there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Kathy's saying this relates to Dan. So I'm sorry. Um, this, this is, yeah, okay. This is where Dan and I both relate to Joseph very, very well. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to lie in church. I'm sorry about that. But, but that's where the problem comes in, right? He's well-built and handsome, and after a while, his wife, uh, master's wife took notice of him and said, come to bed with me. That's quite the pickup line. Like, just, that's pretty blunt, pretty abrupt. Hey, come on, you know, it's like, let's, let's, let's get in here, right? But this is how temptations sometimes work. Sometimes temptations just come right at you like this. Now, let me give you a little, little thought on this because there's some context that surrounds this as why this maybe isn't as much of a red flag as we would think. We read this and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe Mrs. Potiphar would do this. Like, she's being so unfaithful to her husband with all of this. This wasn't that abnormal for her. Like, this is probably not her first time, and it's not because of her. It's because of this, is, this is what an Egyptian wife did. Uh, the wife of an Egyptian official, especially somebody as important as Potiphar, basically had three roles. You're there to satisfy him, you're there to have children, and you're there to host people in your home. That's it. Otherwise, they had a lot of downtime, a lot of alone time. They were just kind of expected 
to kind of do this. Like, this wasn't that crazy for her to have another man come into her home like this. And that's kind of how we have adapted our society as well, too. Like, it doesn't excuse the sin away, but we do it anyway. We justify it. We make it part of who we are. We make it part of our identity, right? That this is just how we're going to live our life, and that's okay. And, and you got to be okay with that. And we kind of get a little put off when, when somebody stands their ground and says, no, I'm going to honor God, not, not fall for that. That's, that's kind of where society has gotten. We justify sin. We compartmentalize sin. Oh, it's just a few bucks I'm going to take off the top. Nobody will notice. Hey, you know, it's not, not that big of a deal. You know, it's just one text message. It's not that big of a deal. We justify it. We compartmentalize it. We put it away, and we come back to it later on. And yet when we stand our ground, like Joseph's about to do, people notice. And there's consequences that come with that. That's number three on the, on the ways we can submit to God better, is we consider the consequences, but we recognize that sin is evil. Now, I don't mean we consider the consequences of the sin. I mean, we consider the consequences of not sinning. You ever think about that? I mean, right now, with, with what's going on just across culture with the month of June, I don't have to explain it to you. You're on social media, you know. What happens if you don't go along with it? There's consequences, you, you, you might be called names, you might be ostracized, you might lose friends, you might have people get upset with you. And this applies to anything. Because if you call something a sin, somebody gets offended by that. You call something wrong, people get put off by that. There's consequences that come with doing the right thing. But at the end of the day, you recognize that sin is sin. Verse 8 after Mrs. Potiphar has come on to Joseph, verse 8, it says, but he refused. He stood strong. Understand something here. Joseph could have done this, and nobody would have said a word. Like, this is one of those things that, that he would have been completely fine in doing by the cultural standard around him. He wasn't going to get in trouble for it. He wasn't going to get hurt for it. He refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. He's, just, he's not bragging. He's just stating a fact. I'm the CEO of this household. Okay, like I'm the one who runs everything here. He says, my master has withheld nothing from me except you. I don't know if that means Potiphar said, hey, you can have everything here except her. Or if Potiphar just did not specifically say, you can have her. But either way, Joseph's like, you're not mine. You're not mine to have. He goes on to say, get this, at the end of this, this passage, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now, this is a little interesting. Why does he not say I could sin against Potiphar? Because that's who he's talking about. No, he's not saying I, I would sin against Potiphar. No, I would sin against God. He understands something here. Yes, we can sin against one another. And those sins against one another can hurt, but ultimately it's his true master that he's concerned about. It's God that he's concerned about. It's God that he does not want to hurt and does not want to sin against here. You think about this because when you sin against each other, we hurt each other. So when we avoid that, what's that speak of? It speaks of our discipline, okay? I didn't do the wrong thing. I didn't hurt you. You didn't hurt me. You're a good person. I'm a good person. This is kind of the way we view this, right? We view this as you do the right thing, you, you avoid doing the wrong thing, and everybody's good. It reveals your discipline. But when you sin against God, those sins in secret that nobody else knows, it reveals your character. It reveals who you truly are on the inside, and that's what eventually down the road somewhere will come out. Sometime those will, will get noticed. And the problem is temptation blinds you to the consequences of that. At the very least, it waters them down. It makes you not think about them. So, so temptation either causes you to ignore the consequences or it causes you to convince yourself that they really won't be that bad or it causes you to convince yourself that you can just talk your way out of them. That's what temptation does. And all of those, let me just tell you, all of those are a lie that the enemy wants to convince you of. And let me tell you from my own experience here, folks, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter how much you, you walk with God, if you get yourself into the wrong spot 
and you're not preparing yourself for the moment properly, you will believe that lie every single time. You will believe the lie that the consequences won't be that big of a deal. We have an enemy who has one mission. Jesus was very, very clear about this in John 10. The thief comes to what? Steal and kill and destroy. He does not care about you. All he cares about is making sure God can't have you or that you don't get to go to God. And he will lie and manipulate and steal and and, and twist and deter, deter everything that he can to get you to believe that it's okay, to get you to believe that it's not that big of a deal. But that's where the grace of God comes in because the grace of God, it's not just about forgiveness for your sin. The grace of God is also about clothing you with righteousness and putting you in a place to stand strong against the enemy who comes to destroy you. The grace of God is there to protect you, which is number four on our our ways to submit to God's discipline. You just avoid temptation at all costs. Maybe you've heard the, the, the phrase Jesus said about cutting your eye out and throwing it into the sea or cutting your hand off and throwing it away. He's not meaning that you've got to literally go start mutilating your body to avoid sin. He means whatever it takes, you do that to avoid sin. That's what Joseph does here. Verse 10, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, she kept up. You know, she was not ready to take no for an answer. He refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. I don't know if this meant that he just refused to be in the same room with her one-on-one or he refused to see her at all. I, I don't know. But whatever it was, Joseph, Joseph demonstrated some pretty impressive self-control here. And I think self-control is one of those things that often we, we have, we demonstrate, we use. But there's one problem with self-control. It's energy-based. The more you use it, the less you have. The more you expend it. And unless you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing, again, before the moment hits you, you can run out. And I think that's a trap a lot of us get. We get so busy. We get so on the go that we don't give ourselves proper rest. We don't spend the time in our word. We don't spend the time in prayer. We don't spend the time surrounded by other people who will build us up and fill that bucket back up that we get exhausted. And exhaustion, that's one of the easiest ways to fall into the trap. That's one of the easiest ways to get suckered into believing the lie. Verse 11 One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. I don't know know if this was by design, if Mrs. Potiphar made sure everybody else was out of the way, or if maybe just maybe Joseph had run out of energy. Maybe the relentlessness of, of her coming after him day after day and him saying no day after day eventually wore him down and wore him out. I don't know, okay? Total speculation here. Maybe he has just tired enough that his guard dropped just a little bit. But she grabbed him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. He left his cloak in her hand and he ran out of the house. And this is where the story really gets going. Because now Mrs. Potiphar is furious. And you know what the Bible says. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, right? It doesn't actually say that, but it probably could somewhere. Like, you know, it's... It's probably like one of the lost proverbs or something, but, but there's a lot of nodding going, you know, it, it, it might as well. Like there's a lot of nodding by both husbands and wives. I won't point out who, but I can definitely see where, where that's believed, right? She is furious and she's so upset. She's so mad that she's going to make sure, she's going to make sure she burns the house down to take him with her. To take him, if she can't have him, nobody can. And this is where Joseph really has to stand strong. This is where we get our fifth key to submitting to God. You have to be willing to sacrifice whatever it costs. Because again, sometimes avoiding the temptation costs you more than than not. At least initially. Falling for the temptation costs you in the long run. But avoiding it might cost you immediately. The rest of the story kind of plays out like this in verse 13. When she saw that he had left her 
uh, his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house. She called the, her household servants. Look, she said, this Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. He, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And then she told him the story. That Hebrew slave you brought us uh, came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife uh, told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where his king's prisoners were confined. You ever get in trouble for doing the right thing? You stick to what you know is right, and it bites you anyway. Maybe, maybe you've gotten taken advantage of. You believed a friend, and you got taken advantage of. You, you got suckered into a bad business deal. Maybe you got passed up for a promotion or you didn't get the recognition that you thought you deserved. Maybe somebody made a choice that hurt you. The, the detour and the trial in your life was not remotely of your own doing, but you're stuck in the middle of it anyway. And it's those moments, it's those moments that cause us to get bitter with God. It's those moments that cause us to want to scream at him and shake our fist at him and just yell, God, get me out of this. Can I, can I just give you one little bit of advice here? If that's you, if you're in that moment, and if not, if you, if you get in this moment one of these days, before you scream at God, before you shake your fist at God, understand this, the righteous will always be vindicated. Always. But not on your time. In God's time. And that's the hard part. The hard part is waiting for him. Here, here's something to think about. And this doesn't always present itself to us as being obvious. But when you're unjustly persecuted by somebody, those people always see God in you. I think sometimes that's why they persecute you. But they see God in you. They know there's something about you. If you Again, if you've prepared yourself for the moment, if you've lived for him, you've walked with him, you've done those things you're supposed to be doing, then they see that in you. Why do you think Joseph ascended to the top of Potiphar's house? Because Potiphar knew there was something about Joseph that he couldn't explain. Why do you think this, that Potiphar put Joseph in prison? Remember, what was Potiphar's job? He's the chief executioner in all of Egypt. Like that, and Joseph's gone. Joseph's just a blip in history. Why does he put him in prison? I think, this is, this is my total speculation, deep down, Potiphar believed him. But he had to do something, because again, he knows that, that biblical verse, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. He's got to do something to appease his wife. I think, maybe, just maybe, he put Joseph in prison because he knew that was giving Joseph a chance to shine before Pharaoh, to shine before all of Egypt because he knew there was something there. Maybe you're trapped in, in a spot of life right now. That something unfair has happened to you. You've lost somebody. You've been cheated. You've been hurt. You've been broken. And you're stuck in that spot. And, and you're looking through this going, is life ever going to be the same again? Let me just let you in on something. If you've been, you faced a detour that strong and you're asking that question, let me just answer it for you. It won't be. Life won't be the same again, but life will be good again. Life will be good again, and maybe, just maybe, when you come all the way through this trial, life will be better than it was before. But unfortunately, sometimes things have to be broken before they can be rebuilt into something better. Things have to be crushed in order to grow. The good news about it, especially if you belong to this church or another church, is that when you walk with other people who are also walking with Jesus, somebody else has probably faced that same thing you're going through right now, and they can be there to help you through it. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 that no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, meaning somebody's dealt with it. Somebody's gone through it. And I love this next part, and God is faithful. He's faithful with you. He's going to walk with you. He's going to not only walk with you, but be there waiting for you when you get through it. He takes you all the way through there. 
If you're stuck in the middle of a detour, you can trust God to lead you through it, or you can make your excuses and try to fight your own way out of it. Just know that when you do that, when you try to fight your own way out, and you excuse your way out, that can lead to caving to temptation, and that can lead to sin. And let me just tell you, I, this, is, this is where I've caught myself too many times. In the last three years especially, you guys know what the last three years have been like for our world. It got very, very hard to always make the right decision. And, and as I looked at, looked at this story and looked at Joseph as he stood strong, it makes me think about why, why do we do it sometimes? Why do we cave? Why do we give in to that, that temptation? Why do we let it eventually overtake us? And I think there's, there's a lot of reasons, but I got three, I think, excuses. that we, I don't know if this is the right way to say this, but three excuses we can come up with for either why we sin or why we cave or why we give in to temptation that we can fall victim to. The first excuse is this. We just, we focus on all the good that we're doing. If I do enough good things, then, you know, that's just one bad thing. But look at all these good, like it's, you know, that scale, the good and the bad on the scale. Or I've done all these good things. So if I fall, I've got a soft landing spot, right? Let me just tell you this right here. This was the most prevalent excuse among Christians and especially among church leaders during the time of covid and, and, and the ensuing time afterwards. Because I can tell you, just from my own experience here, putting in 80 hours a week so that my church could have an online service, putting in time to, to pour into that left me very, very empty. And it was easy to point and say, well, look at all this I've done. We wouldn't have church if it wasn't for me. You know, nobody else in this church knows how to run a video and, and do the production and all that. It's easy to fall into that trap. Let me just tell you something, folks. Privacy and opportunity are a bad combination. They're a bad combination. And you can find yourself getting into spots that you didn't want to get into because here's the truth of the matter. On any given day, you can resist any temptation that comes your way, but the next day you might not. The next day you might not. So what's, your, what's a solution to this excuse? The solution's guardrails. You make sure you've got people in your life that prevent you from having that, that solidarity and that opportunity and that loneliness and that privacy. Get an accountability partner. Get somebody who can be brutally honest with you, who can flat out call you on the carpet if they need to, and they're doing it from love because they know who you are and they know what you're supposed to be doing. The second excuse is this, we explain it away. Well, because of my history, can you really blame me? You know my parents, you know my dad, you know what he did, can you really blame me? If there's one person in the Bible who could have used this excuse, it was Joseph. You know my dad, you, you know that, that trickster, that guy who you know, suckered his birth right away from his twin brother. You know that guy who's got four wives, you know? So for me to just go sleep with this woman is no big deal because my dad would have done it probably, you know? But yet he stood true. He resisted temptation. Why? The solution to this is character. You can play the, the victim card like we said last week and be a product of your system, a product of your upbringing, or you can stand strong for God with his character in your heart and in your life. The third excuse we, we like to use is the blame game. We talked about the blame game last week. The blame game. Well, they made me do it. We may think this is something that we have come up with. The very first sin in recorded history was immediately followed by the blame game. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin. They eat the fruit of the tree. And here's what it says in verse 13. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you've done? And what does she say? The serpent deceived me. He made me do it. And you know why? She's not wrong. That's what the enemy does. He deceives you. But here's the thing. It's still your choice. And you're still the one that gets held accountable to it. Again, what did we say last week? Detours are caused by God, somebody else, or you. Guess which two we always blame. Because we rarely blame ourselves. And if we blame ourselves often, we go ahead and blame somebody else alongside it. Well, it was me, but it wasn't just me. 
You know, I, I'm not the only one who did this. So what's the solution to the blame game? It, it's self-control. Learn to take ownership. Learn to take accountability for your own life. Learn to stand strong. And ultimately learn to trust. Because Joseph could have played any of these cards. Joseph didn't because he stood strong. Because he was prepared for the moment. Because he trusted God in the midst of seeing what was in front of him and not knowing that. And I don't know, Scripture doesn't say when Potiphar threw Joseph in prison, I don't know what was going through Joseph's head. Maybe he thinks he's going to death row because he certainly knows who Potiphar is. Maybe he thinks he's going to be in prison for the rest of his life and wishes that he would be executed just to get the torture over with. I don't know. But what I know is he trusted God. So what do we need to do with all of this? If you're in a detour today and that detour is throwing temptation your way, It's throwing trials your way. It's throwing decisions that you have to make your way. Stand strong. Trust in him. That's that's your takeaway today. Trust that God has a better plan for your life. Because often that's where our temptations come in is when we try to make our own way. We try to get out of what we have to try and get something better. I told you earlier when Joseph was in Potiphar's house that God was with him. And God shone through him. And everybody was blessed because of it. And now he's in prison. And guess what happens, starting in verse 20. While Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him. And he showed him kindness and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all all that was done there. And the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything that he did. That sound familiar? God is faithful. When you're facing trials and you're facing temptations, God is faithful. And if you're not in one right now, prepare yourself for it when it comes because God is faithful. So stay faithful to him. Let's pray. Father, we... We know that trials and the temptations come our way. But we know that that when they come, God, that often we we can be caught off guard. But God, we we know they're going to come because Jesus told us in this world, we will have trouble. But he said, take heart because I've overcome the world. So Father, I pray today for anybody who is currently in one. God, help them to stay strong and focus on you and not, not see an easy way out. Not be deceived that it is the easy way out, but God, have discernment that it's the way you want them to go. Give them strength and encouragement. Give them, God, just just continue to give them boldness to stand. Help them to shine your light in all that they do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I asked uh, Matt and Phil to come out, but I think they might have gotten, there they are. Not Not lost. Here we go. Believe it or not, Matt showed up dressed this way this morning, and then he found out that VBS was space-themed. So, <laughs> didn't know that ahead of time. But uh, I asked these guys to come up here for just a moment this morning. Um, it's uh, officially summertime, at least by the school calendar. For these two guys, that means uh, not just one thing, a couple things, but the main thing is means it's camp season. And... Uh, for Matt, starting tomorrow, it's VBS, then it's camp season. Uh, Phil and, and Becca are getting ready to start spending some time over at Hidden Haven, uh, preparing as well for, for their step into uh, their next journey with, with missions coming up. You can talk to him more about that. But, but we wanted them to come up this, this morning and, and just take a moment and you guys join me in praying over them. Uh, something that you may not realize with these two. You, you may not see them a lot on Sundays. Matt's often down with our kids, which if you don't know, Matt's our, our children's pastor. Phil's our student pastor. Uh, but this is the time of year when lives can be just radically changed. And I know so many of you have a story from camp. Not me, I hated camp, by the way. Um, I had <laughs> one of the worst experiences of my life at church camp. I, I care nothing about, you know. <laughs> Jennifer's asked me, are you going to go to camp with the kids? And she said, no, they were mean to me when I went one time. I'm not going back, but. 
So many of you have a story where your life was changed at camp or at VBS. And these are moments we know that they're, they're brief. Yeah, they might last a few days, they might last a week, and then they come home. But it's these weeks when seeds get planted. Things get said that, that trigger something in our kids, and they come back home, and it's these guys, and it's the rest of us. They get to water that seed. They get to nurture that, that, that new life as it grows. And so I've asked them to come up here this morning. Uh, they've got the next two months, you know, they're going to be in and out. You'll see them, especially on a Sunday morning, running around like crazy because they're leaving at, you know, 11, they're leaving at noon, you know, trying to find that one child that's wandered off. <laughs> that story Jesus told about the one in the 99, that was about a church camp story, trying to find the one child that's... <laughs> <laughs> but we just want to take a moment and pray with them. And as you guys pray, I would encourage you, as you pray on your daily basis, keep these two guys and their groups in your prayers. Even if they're not at camp that week, be praying for them. Some of you are going to go with them to camp. Some of you go with them. Uh, you, some of you are going to be helping starting tomorrow with VBS. And let me just tell you, don't underestimate the role you guys will play in that. Because as somebody who's got three kids going to experience all of this this year, this gets personal for me too. It's not just, these guys don't just do this because it's their job. They do this because it's who they are. Because they care so deeply about the next generation, not just of crossroads, but of the kingdom. So pray for them this, these next few months. Give them wisdom. or pray, pray that God would give them wisdom to say what our students and kids need to hear. That God would give them compassion when they need a little extra grace on those days. That God would give them energy. And that God would give them rest. Not just physical rest, but spiritual and mental and emotional rest when those those weeks turn into just one after the next. I know Matt's got a couple of weeks where he comes home with a group of kids, picks up another group, and goes right back. Be praying for their families, for Stephanie and for Becca and, and the kids that are here not going as they're gone to. Would you guys join me as, as we, if, if, if you feel comfortable, would you reach a hand out even and pray along with me as, as we pray for these guys this morning? Father, we're, we're so grateful for Matt, for Phil, God, for all the other men and women across our our, our churches that are doing the same thing right now, God, preparing for such a powerful and impactful and influential season of our calendar. And God, I pray you would be with them as they go down to Hidden Haven or they go to Peak or as they come here for VBS. God, you would just, just do something miraculous in our, in our kids. Let our kids and our students come home and, and show us something that you've done in their lives. God, this is, this is, this is your kids. If they're your church already. They're not the future of your church. They are your church. And God, we just pray that you would change lives. You would be with Matt and be with Phil. Give them endurance, energy. I thank you for their passion that they have that, that is not even close to going out. But God, on those days when that passion is a little harder to fire up, God, you would just give them a, give them a quick breath. And God, help them to endure. Help them to stay strong the entire summer. And God, as we come back out of this summer too, that that would continue on, God, through our children's ministry and through our student ministry, and that would filter out to the rest of us as a church, and that your kingdom would be blessed because of that. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. VBS is starting tomorrow and going through Thursday, right, Matt? Yep. And it is not too late to sign up as a volunteer. It's not too late to sign up your kid. It's not too late to sign up their friend, a grandkid, whatever it may be. So it's a good opportunity for them to get involved and you can get online and get them signed up for that for tomorrow. Next up, we have our t-shirt orders. Um, they will be, if you walk out these doors in the back, there's a little window on the side of the kitchen. That's where you'll take the orders for the t-shirts. That's a good design that's in. So uh, go ahead and get a t-shirt if you want one. And next up, and lastly, we have our Shelby Sunday. Shelby is the church directory app that we use here. A lot of times guys are like, man, I wish I remembered so-and-so's name that walked in the door. This is a golden opportunity for you to be able to contribute in that. Uh, Vanjie will be out here. She'll take your picture, upload it to your account. And then if you get the app, you can go through and you can kind of see who people are. It's just a a less awkward way to remember names, right? Because we all like asking people after we've seen them 15 times what their name is again. So <laughs> it helps bypass that. Let's go ahead and stand. I'm going to pray and dismiss you, and we're going to play a song as you guys exit.
God, this morning, thank you just for your word, for the story that Joseph brings to us. Excited to be in this series. Just pray that you bless everyone here this week, and it's in your name I pray. Amen. God bless everyone. We'll see you next week. Does it cry? Reply.